to all of you for attending that uh, looks like a delightful uh, course. Um, it's a, a great pleasure for me to address you uh, uh, with some, um, some ideas. So um, I work on the neurobiology of decision making, and I'll tell you a bit about that. But I'm going to um, start with the main thesis that I propose uh, to advance, and that the two, there are really two characterizations of consciousness um, that come from the perspective of a neurologist, which is my other life. Um, and um, well, I should say that one comes from neurology, and it concerns states of arousal, and the other from philosophy, which concerns awareness, authorship, narrative, subjectivity, and many things that kind of we lump into the, um, the consciousness that probably uh, interests uh, most of you and why we would have a conference on it. But the, um, the thesis I'd like to advance is that they share a common framework, and that framework um, that is a neurobiological basis, and that framework is, could be thought of as a decision to engage. And I'm going to try to develop that idea for you. Um, I'm not going to solve consciousness for you, but I'm going to make it a lot easier for us to solve it. Um, and I should say that, in a way, you almost already heard my talk, because um, much to my delight, Roy um, Baumeister um, pretty much presented my point of view. In fact, you'll recognize some of the very same phrases. Oops. Now, if you're asleep where I live in Seattle, this doesn't wake you up. Okay? Now, I'm moving to New York, and apparently, I'm told, I'm promised, that this will not wake me up. Okay, but if you're a young parent, as I was a long time ago now, this always wakes you up. Now, I would argue that our sleeping brains effectively are monitoring the world and making a decision constantly to engage. It's a very simple kind of engagement. This is engaging the world at all. But the, the idea on the table is that, um, is that uh, the neurobiology of the kind of highfalutin philosopher's consciousness shares the same kind of basic organization as the neurologist's very simple consciousness, which really lives on a, um, uh, on a continuum of um, arousability. These are uh, pathological states. I didn't include sleep because sleep is not pathological, but it would belong on, on a list of states of consciousness the way a neurologist sees it. And I put this one in red because I'm going to come back to that at the end of the talk after I'm done telling you a little bit about decision making. Now, now um, my goal here is, is not just to get street cred with you. Um, many of you don't know what I do, but I, I do want to, want to share with you just a few insights from the neurobiology of decision making. Um, and, um, and by doing so, what I'm going to do is establish that, um, that the neurobiology of decision making will ultimately give us insight into consciousness. It'll just be a different kind of essentially um, part of the brain we turn on. Um, although I'll try to dissuade you from thinking about parts of the brain as, as being associated with part, particular functions as we go along. Okay, so um, let's discuss a few things about the neurobiology of decision making. When, in your lives, when you think about decisions, you think about these kinds of decisions, but I have to say they're difficult to study in the lab. Like if you think of the control experiment here, it could get you into trouble. Um, this one, thankfully, um, in my country, was really easy four years ago, so it was too simple a task than uh, we would do in the lab. Uh, hopefully, it'll be that easy again. I'm told it's going to be tricky, but if it's really tricky, I'm coming to Canada, so um, please. Uh, okay, so, uh, and then, um, you know, some, some decisions um, are just unethical and dangerous, so we can't do those in the lab. So what we do is we train rhesus monkeys to perform um, simple perceptual tasks. They're not so simple as you'll see. Um, and they allow us to think uh, formally, quantitatively, and neurobiologically about decisions. And since many of you don't work with monkeys, and I know this is being broadcast, I want to make sure that you understand that we treat these monkeys with great respect and that they feel no pain in any of the experiments that I'm going to tell you about. Um, in some ways, we treat them um, better than I, we treat patients in the hospital, I can tell you, because I do both. Um, in other words, and I, I believe we treat patients in the hospital very well, okay? So, um, um, so um, some of the monkeys I'll tell you about have been in my lab for 17 years doing amazing tasks, and, um, and you'll see that for yourself. Now, um, one of the nice things about working with monkeys is that we know a lot about their brain, and um, at least its organization, and I'm going to focus for you on a part of the parietal cortex called the lateral intraparietal area. It's an area, it's part of Brodmann's Area 7 that was identified by Richard Anderson based on its connections to the frontal eye fields, which I'm pointing to here. Wow, I must be nervous. And... Um, 
uh, and, um, and the superior colliculus. So these are our pa parts of the brain that are involved in eye movement control. You've heard a little bit about this already. Um, there's nothing special about LIP. It's not the decision area. It's an area that we can exploit by contriving tasks so that these neurons become relevant. So uh, here's a, a, an MRI of a rhesus monkey brain taken at this coronal section. Uh, this is the intraparietal sulcus, and the red stuff is the ventral division of area LIP um, as identified by Lewis and Van Essen. And that's where we target neurons and, um, and record from them or stimulate them. I'm just going to play you some recordings from them today. Uh, we record extracellularly, so you just hear the spikes from the neuron. And for those of you that think about all kinds of signals in the brain, bold, LFP, uh, you name it, um, um, spikes are kind of especially interesting because it's the only thing that a neuron has computed that it can tell another neuron elsewhere in the brain. So sort of spying on the basic communication of the neurons, this little binary code of pulses and then silences in between. Okay, now the thing you need to know about neurons in area LIP is that they have spatially selective persistent activity, and that's best illustrated by this short video clip of a monkey whose eye position you'll see in yellow, and who will be asked to make an eye movement to the remembered location of that briefly flashed spot. So let's, uh, it'll appear in this area called the, the cell's response field. Let's listen to the neuron as the monkey does this task. So that's the, um, neuron, the spikes that you heard, the action potentials, now here represented as these little tick marks. Here's what I mean by persistent activity, about a second and a half of it between the time that the red pulse was turned on and off and the time the monkey was told and then ultimately executed his eye movement. So that's persistent activity. The evidence for spatial selectivity is that if we flash the spot over here, you can appreciate the relative suppression. So, Persistent activity is a ubiquitous feature of the phylogenetically newer association cortex. Um, many of us believe it holds the key to understanding higher brain function, cognition, not just consciousness, not just decision making. And the reason why is because it provides a kind of freedom from immediacy. It allows us to do what is necessary for cognition, that is to use information in a time frame that's not, not dictated by immediate change in the world or the need to control body musculature in real time. So it's that change in uh, that evolutionary um, change that allowed us to form, that was, is the seeds of cognitive function. I'm now going to show you uh, the, a very uh, brief um, uh, uh, result from the lab that tested the idea that that persistent activity is a substrate for neural computation, actually reasoning. And what we did in this task, what Tian Ming uh, Yang, a, a, a former postdoc of mine did, was he trained monkey to, monkeys to perform a probabilistic categorization, sometimes called weather prediction by cognitive scientists. Basically, in our hands, the monkey sees a fixation point followed by a series of shapes. Uh, so two seconds pass because it's half a second until the four shape, per shape until four pile up on the screen. And then the monkey waits through a little memory delay and makes an eye movement to either the red or a green target. And, then, and on any given trial, either the red or the green target is rewarded. And the probability that the reward will be at red or green is determined or governed by these four shapes. And the way it works is that the four shapes are drawn from a larger set of 10. They're drawn at random with replacement. You'll notice that five of the shapes are assigned positive numbers. They support reward at red, and they're balanced by these shapes. They got a negative number that support reward at green. And the way the task works is that when there are four shapes up, the sum of these four numbers it determines the log of the odds that red will be rewarded. And if you're not accustomed to thinking like this, um, log of odds is a very natural scale for a degree of belief. Think about it this way as kind of a sanity check. If the probability that red and green were equally, they were equal to, for, for reward, that is if there was no real benefit to red versus green, this ratio is one and the log of one is zero. So it's right in the middle of the scale. Positive log odds means red is more favorable or the, is more probable and negative would mean green. So just to be clear, if the, um, the oh, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll label a graph of log likelihood ratio. That happens to be the same as log odds in this experiment. So if the computer dealt out these four shapes, which it knows is assigned these four numbers that add up to plus two, then we know that red is the more probable source of the reward. But what the computer does is it inverts the pro the, this log odds into an actual probability of rewarding at red. That's the formula for doing so. So if the monkey's clever, and I'll show you in a moment he is, and chooses the red target, which is the better target, he'll still be rewarded with only probability 0.6 roughly. And if he 
messes up, essentially, makes what you could consider an error and chooses the lesser green target, you still might get rewarded with probability roughly 0.4. And um, when Tian Ming and I uh, began these experiments many years ago now, um, we um, thought this was um, a high-risk experiment, and indeed it was, but it paid off. So here I'm showing you um, the results from our first monkey. We've trained many monkeys on this task now. Um, so um, this is a, uh, the probability of the proportion of trials that he chooses the red target as a function of the sum of those four numbers. So notice when they're big numbers, he's almost always choosing red. When they're big negative numbers, he's almost always choosing green. On this axis, you read that he's never choosing red. And here he's kind of distributing his choices. I'll say one quick thing, just to be a little controversial for the psychologists in the room. Some of you will be tempted to see this as a kind of matching of probabilities, but that's not true. He's maximizing. He's always trying to do the best thing. It's basically noisiness in the brain uh, and idiosyncrasies that lead him to this behavior. And in fact, I would say that um, probability matching is a fiction that people made up. It doesn't exist in the animal world. Okay, um, and it probably doesn't even exist for us. Um, so um, now what we do is uh, we do a little trick. We fit these data with a sigmoid. This is called logistic regression. And what it allows us to do is extract weights that the monkey assigned to the 10 shapes. So alpha, these alpha terms are fitted coefficients, subdiamonds of triangle and so forth, and they let us figure out how much relative weight he's given each of the 10 shapes. That's what's going to produce this curve. And on the next graph, I'll show you what those subjective weights are. We're inferring how much weight the monkey has given to each of the shapes. And so here are the weights that the monkey, we infer from that fit. Okay, and here's what we assigned them. And you can see that the monkey gets the idea that five shapes have positive support for red, five shapes have negative support for red, that is, positive support for green. And the most important thing is that he understands that different shapes have different degrees of reliability, some much more than others. There are little anomalies in here, um, and that's very interesting to us, but we don't have time to talk about that. Now, I'm going to play you, uh, again, some examples. This is one of those experiments where you, get to, you just hear a few examples and you pretty much get the whole result. So once again, we're recording from neurons in LIP, uh, where roughly 70% or more have this spatially selective persistent activity, so there's not a big sampling uh, bias in our hands, at least we don't believe so. Again, you'll see the monkey's eye position in yellow. That's the fixation point. Around the fixation point, you'll see the shapes. Now, this is a neuron that we've already screened. We already know that it has that spatially selective persistent activity in a region of the visual field that's down and to the right of the fixation point. So what we do is we'll put either the red or the green target in this response field, and then we'll put the other target opposite the fixation point. So um, you listen to this neuron in real time while the monkey performs the task. You'll hear the neuron again as we did a moment ago, and you'll see it displayed, uh, the spikes displayed um, down here. And you'll also see a graph that I'll explain after you see it. So there's a trial where the monkey chose the red target, which was the one in the response field. Uh, there are the spikes again. And um, this is the log, you can call this the degree of belief, or log likelihood ratio. It's in support of the target that's in the response field, which happens to be the red one on this trial. Okay? And um, what you're seeing, this ye long yellow line is the neutral um, weight of evidence line. So what happened in this trial is the first shape supported, re supported reward at green, but then there was progressive mounting evidence after the second, third, and fourth shapes and through this delay period in support of reward at red, and that's probably why the monkey chose the red target. Now, that mounting support of evidence was accompanied by what you can appreciate here and could hear as a crescendo in the firing rate of the neuron, right? You could just hear that from a single trial and a single neuron in the association cortex. Let's hear another trial. So this time, although the first shape did once again favor the red target in the response field, there's mounting evidence against the target in the response field for green. And now you can appreciate the decrescendo in the firing rate. And here's a more interesting trial. So here things are bouncing around a little bit, okay? And I'm not even going to explain it to you because it was kind of obvious, you know, in increasing activity as the mounting evidence for this, and then it flipped towards the end. Um, and so uh, you can download um, more movies um, from um, uh, our paper um, um, on my website if you like. Um, they're kind of fun to watch. Now, interestingly, um, um, and this is where the quantitative um, part comes in, is that if we take thousands and thousands of trials, and we say, look, after the second shape has come, let's just look at the firing rate across thousands of trials at this point in time. If we plot that, 
as a function of the weight of evidence in favor of the target in, in favor of the target in the response field what we see is a nice linear relationship between this statistical kind of entity degree of belief you might call it and um, and firing rate in fact you the units are two and a half spikes roughly per second per unit of log likelihood ratio the band by the way since this is a meeting in honor of Turing was a term de developed by Turing during his code breaking work um, and um, because one of the ways one of the tricks to breaking the enigma code was this, was accumulating evidence sequentially just like the monkeys are doing with their shapes and the rational thing to do is to accumulate in units of log likelihood ratio and Turing developed this term band which was short for Banbury where these um, pages were printed up uh, to try and uh, break the code um, I could tell you a lot more about that in the break if you like but we don't have, we don't have time for it now the important thing is is that the firing rate is um, some the brain is actually doing some interesting computation here and in fact it preserves that relationship between firing rate and units of degree of belief of log likelihood ratio which remember this is an experimentally controlled variable this is not something we're inferring after the fact we controlled that we gave, we assigned those numbers to the shapes and you can see that it's preserved after the second third and fourth shapes it's harder to discern perhaps it's absent even with the first shape but don't if you think about it for a second there are only 10 unique values of um, uh, here because there's only one shape on the screen at that point okay so the important point from this experiment is that the brain is doing this interesting thing laid out in time. There's contingency. Um, it would, um, um, uh, I think it would meet Ezekiel's um, definition of consciousness. It doesn't make mine, um, but I think a lot of the criteria that Ezekiel put out in the first talk this morning, uh, this would uh, constitute a form of consciousness. I don't believe that's necessary, um, but it's definitely cognitive. But the critical thing is that the persistent activity in the brain, what one might have thought was a substrate for working memory, just holding on to information through a time gap, is actually a substrate of computation. Okay? In fact, here the kind of computation that underlies a very simple form of reasoning from evidence. I also mentioned that it's optimal. I put optimal in inverted commas in part because, sorry. Um, oops, sorry about that. I'm going to run out of time. Oh well, uh, because because we don't, um, we none of us really knows what a, what the brain is trying to optimize. Okay, um, but what all I meant by optimal here is that the um, uh, the brain is assigning greater firing rates to the to the cues with greater reliability, and that's a sensible thing to do when reasoning from evidence. Okay, now the bulk of our work um, has really been involved in um, in trying. Um, in, we're at this point in the talk now, uh, trying to understand um, um, decisions about um, um, that are much more perceptual. And we started working on um, uh, uniting um, ideas about how we both make a choice that, and, and uh, essentially thoughts about accuracy of the choice, how long it takes to make the choice. And recently, we had a nice discovery, we think, on uh, uniting that with um, how it is that a brain achieves a sense of certainty or confidence. And I'm just going to share that with you pretty quickly. Um, so um, what we do is we train monkeys uh, to, um, um, to decide left or right. They're deciding left or right uh, based on seeing a patch of random dot motion that's um, um, moving um, either, uh, the, uh, either, to the, either towards one target or the other, in this case right or left. Now, um, these are random dots developed by Bill Newsom, my former advisor, Ken Britton, and Tony Mavshin in their work studying perception. And we're going to exploit this to understand decision making. Now, on any given trial in the experiment I'm going to tell you about, left and right are equally likely. Okay, and that's, you call it the pr a neutral prior. Um, and, um, and, and so the monkey has to judge the net direction of this motion. We control the uh, strength of this motion, that is the difficulty, by, um, by varying what we call the motion coherence. And technically, that's the probability that a dot uh, plotted at one moment in time will be um, displaced 40 milliseconds later in motion. The remaining probability goes to the background noise. So in this case, this is about 50% um, uh, coherent motion. It's the easiest thing we ever show the monkey. And if you can't tell that the net direction of the motion is rightward, please talk to me afterwards. Again, I'm a neurologist, and so I can help you, or at least tell you what's wrong with you. OK, so, um, so um, I don't really believe that about neurology. I, I see us as very therapeutic these days. but. Um, so um, I apologize to um, uh, Ezekiel and any of the other neurologists that I've just um, 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 offended. Um, it's just the beginning of the offensive things I'm about to say, by the way. I, so, um, oh, so, all right, so um, anyway, in the experiment I'm going to tell you about first here, just as a warm up, the monkey um, uh, gets to control viewing duration. So we measure both his choices and his reaction times, and I'll explain to you how those are related to each other. 
So in a reaction time experiment, um, uh, what happens is, um, we're, you know, of course, we, we don't control anymore how long the visual stimulus is up. But what I'm showing you is a graph of firing rate. This is the average from 60 neurons plotted during the period of the time that the monkey is making his decision. So time zero on this graph is when the random dot motion was turned on. So there were two targets already present. So there's a high firing rate of the neuron. Something funny happens. And then, um, and then you'll see in these um, solid curves, um, are these the trials that are going to ultimately end with the monkey choosing rightward, the target that happens to be in the response field? And these dash curves are the opposite trials. And so what this is telling us is that there's something happening in, this, these, by, of these, in these neurons that are indicative not just of what the monkey's going to do with the information, that is, which eye movement he's going to make, but something about the quality of the evidence leading to that. And the reason I say that is because um, uh, these colors represent the degree of difficulty, gold being the easiest we show the monkey, red being something intermediate. There are several other intermediates, uh, intermediate difficulties that I'm not showing you, um, but they sort of, you could say, see them, think of them as occupying the middle of the graphs. And then these, um, these uh, um, extreme, um, these blue curves correspond to trials where the monkey might as well be guessing he's being rewarded at random, but he's thinking that there's, mo there's something in this stimulus that supports him saying right or left, okay? So um, nothing mis mis mystical about that, um, but in my view, it's, um, it's um, a lot more interesting than, um, than um, uh, binocular rivalry and um, all kinds of uh, bistable things that seem to interest the consciousness community because it's interesting because we have a handle on it. So, um, so um, without resorting to magic, someone mentioned the paper out in Neuron, and that is magic. So now, um, um, so what I want to tell you also is that this, 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 this rise in activity is occurring during the period of the time that the monkey's forming his decision but hasn't yet made it. Um, and it looks very different than the evidence that's coming to this association area of the parietal cortex from the visual cortex. So from the visual cortex, you kind of get a step in activity. This is firing rate as a function of time. And in the parietal cortex, something like a ramp. And if you're an engineer, you say, oh, that's kind of making me think about computations that sound like integration in time, integration in the calculus sense. In the end of the trial, Okay, it, now we, you, know, we've, you haven't seen any spikes in these averages that are anywhere near the, actual, the monkey's actual eye movement response. But if we align the, the responses to the eye movement, you see that they come together um, just before he makes his eye movement. And so that suggests to us a process of making a decision that is um, like, um, uh, like a diffusion, like a bounded uh, diffusion. So by analogy to diffusion, I'm, let's, let's think about that for a second. Imagine a particle that was diffusing in this up-down dimension. You could think of this particular path, just some random path that gets absorbed in this upper bound, as the accumulation of momentary displacements in the up-down dimension. And what I'm encouraging you to think of is that the decision might be likened to the accumulation of momentary evidence, a stream of information coming from the visual cortex in this place, but bearing on hypotheses is right more likely than left. And now the idea is that, is that the decision stops when a sufficient amount of evidence represented by these gray lines, these bounds, um, terminates the, the process. The beautiful thing about that idea is it couples in a single very simple mechanism um, the amount of time it takes to make a decision with how accurate that decision will be. Because if we place these bounds further away from the starting point of the accumulation, we'd basically be saying you must accept a much higher level of certainty um, uh, or of evidence anyway before stopping. And of course, that would come at a cost, a cost of time. Okay, so um, that's the basic idea. The evidence for the, at least an upper bound is that the responses come together on one of these choices. We actually don't believe in the lower bound. We think that this is really a race between a mechanism like the one I'm showing you that's accumulating evidence for right and against left, but, um, uh, but it's just racing against the neuron neurons on the other side of the brain that are accumulating evidence for left and against right. And that's why these responses, if you've been looking closely, don't come together. Okay, these are really details. The, um, the beauty of this idea was not um, developed by us, but first discovered um, during World War II um, simultaneously by Abraham Wald in this country, um, doing uh, work really on quality control in munitions, um, sequentially sampling how many, how many of these munitions do you need to explode before you decide 
decide the lot is worth shipping or not. And um, also a classified work during World War II, as I mentioned, Alan Turing used a mechanism like this to um, try and discover whether, t whether randomly intercepted uh, messages encrypted on Enigma machines had their rotors in exactly the same setting. That was a key part of breaking the code. Again, I can tell you more about that. Um, now, the, this also lies, this whole idea of making decisions lies at the center of sequential analysis, which was pioneered by Abraham Wald, and we read his, his uh, papers. We, don't, we didn't get to know about Turing's until they were declassified in the 1970s, and by then, as you know, Turing had taken his life tragically. Now, um, this idea was also brought into the psychology literature um, by uh, many people. Um, I would say for the students, a really interesting book to read is one by Stephen Link, if you're interested in sort of the mathy side of it. Um, and, um, and then these are some of the other important uh, contributors to the literature. By no means is this an exhaustive list. Now, in our hands, we know a lot, lot that, more than I have time to tell you. Uh, we know a lot about that momentary evidence coming from the visual cortex. Um, V5, MT was mentioned already. Um, we know, uh, based on microstimulation experiments, that that evidence is arrayed in the form of right minus left, that that really is what is being accumulated. Now, here's the cool thing for us, though. We know so much about this that with just a few degrees of freedom, we can take the monkey's behavior and do the following. I'm showing you one part of the monkey's behavior here. That's his reaction time, plotted as a function of motion strength. Reaction time is the time that elapses from onset of the random dot motion to the time the monkey moves his eyes. And what you can see is that when the motion's strong, easy, he takes him about 400 milliseconds in this experiment. And when the motion's made weaker, he's taking progressively longer. Okay? Uh, these are just averages, um, and there's a pretty wide distribution around those averages. Okay? Now, here's the interesting thing. This smooth curve is a fit to this equation, which is the the times that you would predict uh, for, um, uh, for the uh, motion to, for the accumulated evidence to reach one or the other bound, okay? So it's a reasonable fit. I mean, but let's not go into details. Here's the amazing thing, though, is that once you have um, fit this kind of a mechanism to these data, the reaction time, you've used up all the degrees of freedom to explain the choice, because the idea on the table is one mechanism explains which choice is made, whether this bound is hit before this bound, and, um, uh, and also how long it takes to do that. So now we're in this very unusual position in animal behavior. We've made one set of measurements, and we can only, we're, we can only predict the others. We have to say that these two motion strengths, he should be performing perfectly, or nearly so, and then he should tend towards chance, this is proportion correct, you should tend towards chance, which would be 50% correct, at exactly this rate. And that's the predictions, and that's where the data lie. Now, there, were little, there, are, there are some drawbacks to this model and lots of very simple fixes to it. Actually, one simple fix that is really, I'll just tell you, the bounds collapse as a function of time um, uh, because time is costly. And that completely um, makes this model explain all kinds of things that uh, were considered anomalous up to then. So, um, but it, what I really want to impress you with is that there's something to this idea that at bounded evidence accumulation explains the trade-off between speed and accuracy in a monkey, and I should say the exact same um, um, psychophysics um, and regularities apply to humans. So. Um, um, now, um, with that in hand, we felt that we were uh, ready to rise to uh, Douglas Vickers, a famous uh, uh, math, mathematical psychologist from Australia's challenge. His challenge was to understand um, the three pillars of decision making, which was choice, reaction time, and confidence. But confidence is very difficult to study because it just seems so subjective. So what we did was we trained a monkey on something called post-decision wagering, which some of you will recognize is, is said to be a form of metacognition. In our hands, it works like this. The monkey sees um, random dot motion, only now uh, Ruzbe Kiani, who performed these experiments, he is not allowing the monkey to tell us how long he wants to take. He, Ruzbe controls the viewing duration. Okay, so the, the random dots go on, then they go off. The monkey sits here just waiting to tell us left or right. He knows the answer by now. He sits in a delay period for on the order of a second or more. And then at, uh, uh, on a random half of the trials, we probe him and we say, well, which, which direction was it? And he tells us left or right. And if he's correct, this is the key thing, if he's correct, he gets a reward. And if he's not correct, he gets nothing. Okay? But on the other random half of the trials, we give him a third option, this sure target. He can kind of bail out with this sure target. The way it works is that, again, he can answer left or right. And if, he ans if he's correct, he gets a reward. If he's wrong, he gets nothing. Or he can choose this third target. And, and in that case, he'll always get a reward. It's just a small reward. Okay? So the idea is that by, that by um, choosing this sure target, he's telling us that he was less confident 
about the left-right choice. So it's, a, it's an indirect way of asking the monkey a question not just about the answer to the decision, but something about his insight, you might say, about the decision process. And uh, it worked, and here's the evidence from behavior so this is the um, proportion of correct choices the monkey makes, again, as a function, function of motion strength. But these are the trials where he had to give us an answer, left or right. He did not have that option to bail out. Remember, while he's watching the random dot motion, he doesn't know if he's going to have that option or not. Okay? So I'm collapsing across all the viewing durations to make things easy. But, um, but, but um, to, I mean, to, I didn't mean that. that I, I, what I meant to say is to make the graphs uncomplicated. Um, so, uh, and what you can see, once again, when the motion's strong, the monkey's about perfect, and he tends towards chance uh, um, as, the motion make, is, is, as we make the motion weaker. Now, if we look at the trials where we did offer him this opportunity, this third target, this sure target, we can look at how often he chooses it. And sure enough, he chooses it about half the time when the motion's weak, and then he chooses it about you know, 10% uh, of the time when the motion is uh, strong. So that's a reasonably rational thing to do. But here's the thing that impressed us about this mon these monkeys' behavior. Um, and that is, consider the trials where the monkey was offered the opportunity to bail out and choose that sure target. But he waived that opportunity. Now, on those trials, he's answering left and right so we can see how well he does. And I'm showing you that in blue here. He does better on those trials. At every motion strength, by just having the opportunity to reject the trial, because he's uncertain, presumably, he improves his performance on the remaining trials. This holds at all viewing durations, and it even holds if we show identical movies, the, the exact pattern of random dots. Okay? Just by having the opportunity to, to bail out, um, he can improve his lot when he doesn't. Now, what that tells us is that the monkey is not making some assessment about the difficulty and then, and then kind of flipping a coin, bailing out with some probability. Okay, what it tells us he's doing, or what his brain is doing, is relying, is, 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 is uh, sorry, assessing the degree of reliability in the stream of evidence. And by rejecting the trials where the reliability seems less, that's, he can improve his performance on the remaining trials. It's a very hard standard to achieve in um, animal behavior. And, um, and it's one of the reasons that many of us feel that um, we will be working with rhesus monkeys for these kinds of cognitive tasks for a while. Now, I'm going to give you a, um, um, a, um, a, just a quick intuition about how this works. I've already told you about this bounded evidence accumulation model. In this particular experiment, since we're controlling viewing duration, you know, some trials are really short. Like maybe consider a trial where the accumulated evidence was net, oh, net negative. It's on the lower half of the graph. Uh, but it just ended here. Well, we would say the monkey would choose leftward. Okay, so here's a simulation of a thousand trials, just to give you an idea. Um, some trials are lo long in duration, some are short in duration, some are caused by weak motion stimuli, some are caused by easy motion stimuli, okay? And, um, um, and um, some trials go on long enough where we think the monkey curtails his evidence accumulation because of a bound, even though we don't measure reaction time. That's another study we did. Um, in any case, this represents the state of the brain that would give rise to a choice. Now, what's the choice? The choice should be a rightward if you're in the upper half of this graph and leftward if you're in the lower half. But what I'm going to do is color code this, these state of the brain points um, by whether or not the monkey was correct or not. And the idea that I'm trying to get across to you is that the error trials, which are shown in red, are sitting kind of in the middle of the graph. And if we do the real math on it, what we can do is we can map out the association between the state of the evidence, which is on the vertical axis, and how much time has elapsed with the log of the odds, again, the degree of belief that, um, that the monkey will be correct or incorrect. And the cold colors mean you're as likely to be correct or incorrect. Remember, the log of one is zero. So that's zero in the middle of the graph. But if the evidence has drifted far for, away from this, then um, you can, uh, be, the monkey can be reasonably certain that if he makes a right or a left choice in the bottom of the graph, he'll be correct. Um, there's some very interesting features of this graph. He's more he can be more certain if he achieves the same degree of, of evidence at shorter times. That was a bit of a shocker. But the critical thing is, is that very simply, the monkey could put a little region around the most uncertain point and basically say that if the evidence only got me into that middle region, then choose the sure target. I'm uncertain. And if it's outside of it, well, then choose right up here and choose left down here. And that basic idea, which involves just three parameters, um, was what uh, gave rise to the fits I showed you. That was the black curve and this red curve. And once again, just for fun, we kind of contrived the calculations so that we have to predict 
how much improvement the monkey would achieve on the trials where he um, didn't take our offer to for the sure target. And that, that blue curve happens to be predictions again, and the and the dot and the and the and the, and the circles of the data. Okay. Now this we're very excited about this experiment. This is ongoing work in the lab. Um, um, because um, uh, we feel we've risen at least partly to Vickers' challenge and united accuracy, response time, and confidence under uh, a common mechanism. And, um, and uh, we're, we think that this is a, allows us to bridge um, uh, something that seems um, um, a bit subjective, um, like um, degree of belief, um, with um, kind of objective measures in the brain. Um, and we're doing a lot of experiments um, to um, see what stimulation of the brain kind of does to those kinds of this kind of measure. Um, there's another uh, interesting aspect, which I'll tell, explain to you later, why it would be that elapsed time has something to do with, um, with um, the assignment of certainty or confidence. Um, uh, it's, um, it's, it was a surprising thing to us, but um, that's just, um, uh, uh, it makes some sense. The simple intuition is that if you're still deliberating and time has gone by, then time has told you that probably the source that you're deliberating over, deliberating over was probably unreliable. And, um, and then there's, um, we can formalize that. Um, so, um, right, oh yeah, and then, yeah, okay. So um, now, um, since this is a, a, many of you have um, philosophical interests, um, I'm often asked whether this really is a form of metacognition, and of course it is technically, because in addition to the decision, the choice that is, the monkey is also reports on the, de on the um, decision process. But on the other hand, I've just explained to you how this works in a very nuts and bolts sense, okay? And so, but to me, this is a really important point, explaining how the brain achieves cognition does not explain away cognition, okay? It just gives us some insight into how it works. Um, now, um, having said that, um, everything I've told you up to now, to me, does not necessarily invoke P, I don't mean phenomenal, but P, philosophers, consciousness, okay? Obviously, um, we do need um, the neurologist consciousness, I mean, but that's trivial. The monkey has to be awake to do these experiments. And that, um, but that does get me to um, the last part of the talk, which is to try to explain why it is that the neurobiology of decision making gives us some insight into consciousness once we start thinking about consciousness as a decision to engage in certain ways, and those certain ways uh, involve um, the po possibility to report, okay, which I think is basically social, very consistent with um, Roy Baumeister's uh, talk. So the idea here is that there are principles emerging from these kinds of studies, ours and others, um, that are telling us something about these cognitive functions. They include things like integration, that is accumulation of evidence, termination rules. I've been emphasizing bounds on evidence. There's also bounds on time, which you can call deadlines. Um, computations that look like probabilistic inference. We heard a little bit about that earlier today um, and uh, in the second talk. And, um, and I want to emphasize this part, that what I call an intentional framework for computation. And it very much dovetails on uh, what Paul Chiswick was saying. Now look, it's not an accident that um, we're finding these cognitive-like signals in structures in the brain that connect the sensory cortex with the motor cortex. In, in evolution, our association cortex was built as an elaboration on a sensory, sensory motor design. And what I mean by that is that if you look at the area of the brain that um, I've been emphasizing, it receives input from the visual cortex and it sends its output, as I said, to oculomotor structures. That, how, that is how LIP was defined and identified. But you can think of that, uh, that area as taking a stream of data and construing it as evidence bearing on an embodied kind of hypothesis. Might I look here or there? I don't have to do it, by the way, but might I do it? I engage the information in that kind of interrogative, querying kind of way. Um, now, now um, the, um, and that's all that's happening in these experiments that I'm showing you. Now, if you go across the sulcus to MIP, or sometimes called the parietal reach region, these are structures that also receive information about vision, and, um, th but their output is to structures that are premotor to the reaching system. They are basically saying, is this information, this is taking information and it's construing it as evidence bearing on peripersonal spaces, places of possible reaching, okay? 
And if you, um, if you go down the sulcus on the lateral side here again, well, you get to AIP, the anterior intraparietal area. It it's, it's gets slightly different visual input, but it's, um, its output is the structures that are premotor to how we grasp with our hand, how we how the posture of the hand during grasp. I would say that basically it's in the business of evaluating shape. Why? Because information about the world is not really information about the world uh, with labels on it. There's no need for a homunculus to put labels on things. The problem of vision is getting answers to the questions that the kind of behaving brain poses to, the, to its data gathering um, um, epithelia effectively. And all it knows about the epithelia, of course, are the representations in the, um, in the sensory cortex, the fleeting representations. Cognition is free from immediacy, whereas the information from the world is, key, is basically has to keep up with the changes there. Okay? Now, this idea, of course, to a neurologist, when you lose all this, you just lose any knowledge, gnosis, you know, with the silent G, of, 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 spa of contralateral space. And it's only in the physiology lab that we realize that that's really parsed up more finely into particular kinds of intentions. Now, um, and this basic idea extends not via action, but via neurobiological function to abstraction. So, for example, if you train a monkey to, make, to decide left or right, but not know what he's going to do about it, Simply sit there, no left or rightwardness, and then, um, but tell him later, by the way, which way was it? Because if you thought it was rightward, choose a red target. If you thought it was leftward, choose a green. But these targets can be anywhere. Then the monkey can't plan an action, okay? So he is doing an abstraction. So what's happening in the brain? Does that completely debunk anyone who's ever said that you know, should think about the brain in terms of affordances actions? No, it debunks it if you're too literal about it and think you have to do actions. But if you take it, and take it uh, from another point of view, from the computational point of view, or I might just say from the principles of cognitive neuroscience point of view, things like accumulation, termination, all you really need to posit, and this is a bit speculative, we have not proven this yet, um, is, that, is, that, is that there are structures in a larger brain that also that take evidence from the world. They don't construe it as evidence bearing on an action, okay, but a bearing on evidence to uh, to turn on another circuit, which in this case would say, when two targets appear on the screen, choose the red one. Okay, something you can train a monkey to do in 15 minutes. So he has the circuitry to do that, to take color as an instruction for an eye movement. So we just need a piece of cortex that can basically say, hey, in this situation, treat the motion as the kind of thing that becomes an instruction. Now, you know, if you think about it, that's rudimentary symbol manipulation. In my view, it's that kind of circuit selection, really making decisions not to do something, but to turn on another module that, um, that is the difference between the rhesus monkey brain and our brain. I don't think anything special beyond that really needs to occur. What we really need are decisions to make decisions about decisions. You know, cascade that out about four times, and now we've got to Gary Kasparov, or maybe my, my version of Gary Kasparov, you know, another report chess playing. Okay, so, um, so now that gets me to the punchline here. So, so decisions to engage another circuit is the key to most of cognition. I don't know if I want to say 99.44% of cognition, but, um, but a lot of cognition. And as a neurologist, I believe that my patients who have suffer from disorders of cognition are much worse off on, by virtue of, the la of their non-conscious processing that they lose than the conscious, which they almost use to, consciousness, which they almost use to get around their deficits. Um, in any case, these, lots of cognition occurs without the philosopher's consciousness, and I think it's very rich. It's our rich cognitive lives that has, was alluded to earlier. Um, so um, the decision to engage in certain ways um, on the other hand, um, uh, it gives rise to the neurologist consciousness, that's the engaging at all, uh, and things like awakening from sleep, and to um, uh, the philosopher's consciousness, um, I think, through engaging in the way of possibly reporting to another or to the self. And you know, a simple example of that is just pointing out to another agent, um, and uh, other versions of that include att uh, attaching narrative or making the non-conscious decision that, when I, that, I, that under the right context I want to retrieve this thing, that retrieve information in order to possibly report. I'm putting word, emphasis on the words possibly or in provisional to give you the idea you don't have to actually have to do this. It's the way, you, it's the way our brains are engaging the information. This is an idea. In vision, this is Helmholtz. Helmholtz said, don't think about where things are in the world by where they land on the retina or the visual cortex. Think about where things are in the world by the, what it would take to grasp the object with the gaze. Okay? Uh, this is Merleau-Ponty, who said, don't think about vision as 
as, um, as you know, putting labels on objects, okay? Or, you know, trans he said, you know, the blind man uh, doesn't know the world in front of him by transducing the vibrations at the end of the stick into a, into the, uh, a picture of the world. The blind man asks questions. Can I, will I bump into this thing? Will I, can I walk through this thing? And gets answers from the world via the stick. Okay, so that's the way to think about the organization of information in the brain. It's a very liberating thing. There's no combinatorial explosions. There's no need for a lot of nonsense. Um, and uh, so, um, so there we go. Um, so what is it in the brain that does this? I'm getting close, Wolf. Um, it's, um, the, the, the insight comes from the neurologist consciousness. So, so many of you, uh, you've already heard the thalamus mentioned, and you've heard about the intralaminar thalamus. Um, you know that um, the, a patient in a minimally conscious state a few years ago was woken up by a team head led, led by Nick Schiff. Um, what did they do? They stimulated the um, midline or intralaminar nuclei of the thalamus, and they woke this patient up. It's a beautiful story. Um, I had the opportunity to examine that patient um, by video, and um, it's really quite remarkable what happened there. Um, the important thing is, is, that, is that we've known for a long time that the intralaminar um, nuclei of the thalamus kind of represent the extension of the waking up reticular activating system of the midbrain. Okay, why am I telling you this? Because Ted Jones made this interesting suggestion many years ago. This uh, is an anatomy point. Ted said that, look, you know, in the phylogenetically newer parts of the thalamus, you get neurons that have all of the kinds of um, uh, genetic labels like halbinden um, and, um, and, and, and um, uh, connectivity um, um, uh, um, criteria, uh, you know, uh, what am I, I can't come up with my word now. Um, anyway, <laughs> characteristics, thank you. Um, that, uh, that these intralaminar nuclei um, have. That is, they projections to more diffuse layer, uh, diffuse uh, areas of, uh, of the cortex in the upper layer two and even layer one. And, um, and there's been some recent work, um, I'm thinking of a paper by Murray Sherman, but there's been others that suggest that what this does is it allows cortical-cortical communication to occur. Okay, it's a way of, of allowing a system to kind of come online. Now, whether that will actually solve the problem of how does one circuit turn another on, I don't know. Now, when you start thinking about this, now you start thinking, okay, so, so basically, a decision to engage has the, is kind of like turning a circuit on, and so something must therefore turn on those thalamic circuits, and so if you look at the innervation patterns, um, the, um, some interesting suspects come to light. One is the, what's called the default network, the thing that comes online when we kind of get up from sleep or wake up from anesthesia, or you know, the thing that's idling when we're not doing anything. And and then, um, and I believe the auditory association areas in man is, are, is another interesting candidate because I think that that is the least developed um, part of the association cortex in the monkey, and that's all I'll say about that. But, um, okay, so let me just say now, I'm not going to say how do decisions to engage work. Why not? Because ultimately we don't know. And the main limitation to this thesis that the neurobiology of consciousness is can really be thought of as a decision to engage. The main limitation is that we don't understand the critical mechanism, which is circuit selection. Okay, we'll be working on that. It is something we can work on, though. And the, so the dividend of this idea is that, is that it's a candidate mechanism. Okay, it's... It builds on the neurobiology of decision making, and if I've impressed you with anything, I hope that you realize that that's a pretty rich um, um, foundation. Um, and um, even the, um, it might build also on the neurology of um, the neurobiology of the of consciousness as seen through the eyes of a neurologist, where the, which is involving mainly arousal. The critical, uh, the real advantage is that it does not evoke magic. So. Oftentimes, I, I was sort of gritting my teeth as people kept saying, is this the area that does this? Is this the area that does that? And it's a very popular way to think about neuroscience. But you don't have to think about that. There are certain computational principles that are, that are reiterated, and really based on, depending on connectivity, they have their particular, um, their particular um, uh, manifestations. Um, and so the magic that I'd like to see removed, um, uh, with all respect to many in the room, are the synchronies and the, bi the, synchronies and the oscillations and the various things that you, you basically, the, 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 to pick on Francis Crick, the, um, the, the idea that, that if you take a representation and wiggle it at 40 hertz, suddenly we're conscious of it. I mean, I just think those things are, are um, well, I won't say nonsensical, but they're not necessary and they are magical because they didn't, there's no how behind them. It's, there's just... Well, that just makes them conscious.
So the beauty of this, I believe, or the promise, I should really say, is that it can be studied in model para paradigms um, that require really only the neurologist consciousness, that is, wakefulness. And so with that, I'll stop. I'll thank my funding agencies, but especially thank the monkeys and the people in the lab that do the work. Um, thank you. So questions, please. 